last week, we talked about creating a rule of life. And so today we are going to get into the specifics of how you do that. How do you create a rule of life? Well, we have four steps for you that will take some of your principles, these general ideas about how to live for God, and will help you apply them with rhythms and habits that you can do every day that will help you to live for God. So hope you'll join me. Welcome to a more beautiful life collective podcast. We know that in the hectic hurry of everyday life, it's easy to lose sight of what really matters. This is a moment to pause and realign your focus on the one who gives us peace and rest. We're focusing on discipleship, productivity, and homemaking as we live with eternity in mind. This is the place where you'll learn to create a life you love and cultivate your heart for God. I'm Casey Fletcher. Thanks so much for joining me. everyone. This is episode 34 of season one of a more beautiful life collective podcast. Today, we are diving into how to create your rule of life. If you listen to the last episode, you know what a rule of life is. It's just a way of creating a plan of habits that help you to take some of these foundational concepts that we have. So your statement of faith, your Christian virtues, your principles for Christian living, and apply those. This is part of our series on why what you believe matters. And what we're doing is creating a method of Christian living, starting with that statement of faith, creating a list of virtues, creating those principles. And this is the last step to make sure that you take all of this abstract ideas and the work that you've done, and you create a system to apply those things in a way that is not necessarily easy to do all the time, but a way that will make sure that you've actually applied what you've thought about and um, will help you live for God. So today we are going to get into that rule of life. Now, if you are interested in any of the things that we've been talking about, I have a system that has four workbooks. So basically these workbooks will walk you through that entire process from start to finish. You can find those individually on the shop as, and also as a bundle on our practical theology bundle that you can find on the shop at a more beautiful life collective.com slash AMBL shop. You can also find a uh, workbook that goes through 10 core key Christian doctrines, and it will just help you to create that statement of faith. Now on to the episode. So last week we talked about what a rule of life is, this idea of this scaffold for Christian living that helps you to implement some of your ideas and ideals and those virtues. So today we're going to talk about how to actually create that rule of life. Now, before we get into this, you might have this question, and this is going to depend on the type of person you are. I always feel like there's, you know, there's two sets of people, and I always feel like I say that. Um, but I, basically, with anything, I always feel like we always have the spectrum of people. You'll either have people who approach it one way, uh, and then you'll have another that is the exact opposite. And so, in this situation, some people are like, "Yes, I want to have a system. I want to have my, you know, my habits, my rules, my schedule, my plan." And then you have the type B person that says, "Ah." Eh, why do we need to do all this? And so you, depending on the type of person you are, you might be saying, why can't I just wing it? Why, why are you talking about doing all this? It sounds like a whole lot of extra work. I read my Bible. I do my best. That's all I can do. And I would say in certain seasons of life, that's probably, I understand that. And I've, I've been there too, where you feel like the best that you can do is just reading a couple of verses every day and just praying and hoping for the rest. And I think God sees you wherever you're at. But I think the reason why it's important to make sure that we take the time to do our rule of life is quite simply, you know, long story short, uh, is that, you know, if you don't make a plan, you're basically, again, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And so I think this would be an example of if you don't take the time to set up this rule of life, you're probably not going to be doing all the habits and things that you wish that you could do. Now, there's a there's a point where there's certain things that it is hard for us to do. It's hard for us to do all the things we want to do right at, on time, like right at that moment. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. But If you think of certain things that you're like, yes, I would love to have this habit in my life, you want to make a plan to have it in your life. I uh, think of this, you know, and anybody who is growing up and moving into uh, certain adult responsibilities, you know, if you're young and you've just moved out, you kind of recognize this. And what it is, is anybody who has taken on a house to take care of a house, so this kind of like hashtag adulting, you know that there's a little bit of a learning curve. 
that people don't really talk about. They talk about it more, I think, as we have people coming up and they're making videos about how they don't want to adult today and things like that. But sometimes it is difficult to say, okay, how do I do the laundry? How do I make a meal and have a meal, a meal on the table every single day? How do I, you know, take care of all these other people and still find time to take care of me? You know that if you've, if you've watched any videos, you see that people really actually struggle with this. And there is a lot that you have to learn. I remember whenever I first got married, one of the things that I really struggled with is just keeping up with the laundry, keeping it folded. And this is not to say that I don't have three baskets of clothes that need to be folded, but I have a lot more laundry now uh, than I used to. But even whenever it was just me and my husband, I was trying to do clothes. It's like they, they would sit there on the floor for like a month and it's like, I don't even have anybody I'm taking care of. That was just laziness. But I think the thing is, is we go through this where now that doesn't happen. Like I always have, you know, it's, there's a revolving door in the laundry room, but there's always clothes that are being folded and being put away almost daily. It's the same thing as dishes used to be where it would be difficult for me to get a load of dishes done every day. Now it's like second nature used to be that was difficult for me to get a meal on the table every day. And we would eat a lot more takeout. And now, you know, I have my whole system in place. I can meal plan. I can plan, do the grocery shopping. And you can almost do it now as it's automatic. And again, you know, depending on the stage that you're in, some of you might be nodding along saying, yes, laundry is the bane of my existence. Some of you guys might be feeling a little bit on the other end where you It's been a long time since you struggled with those things because you're a little bit older and wiser than me. And so I think the thing is, we go through these times where we know that we should do things, but it's difficult to find the systems. But then after a while of practicing and working on it and being consistent, you can look back at your days and you can say, oh, wait, no. I do have a good habit with that. Like I am doing a good job with that. And you can look back on your life and see how far you've grown. I feel like that, you know, with my devotional time, there was a time where it was really difficult for me to wake up in the morning. Again, it's funny. You say things uh, where you're like, looking back, it's like, I had it so easy back then, but you just don't realize. But like in college and stuff, you're like, oh, I have to wake up and go to class and try to do my Bible reading too. You know, your class is at like 11 and you feel like it's too early early for you to wake up or something like that. Uh, And then you grow up and then you have to wake up at, you know, four or 5 a.m. so you can get to work on time. And you're like, okay, I had it a lot easier back then. But I think with that, like I can look back and I can say, I know whenever I used to put off doing my Bible reading and I was one of those people, I would try to catch up and read like three hours in one day so that I could get up with the reading plan that I was following on my phone. And, you know, now I don't do that. Now it doesn't mean that I wake up every day and do my devotions. Like sometimes life happens or you sleep in or kids are up half the night and you just have to roll with what you are, what your life is like. But I think that if you look at the consistency that I've gained, you can see the benefits where now I'm able to, through my devotions and things like that, I'm able to do devotionals. I'm able to write things for the blog. There's been a treasure that I've stored up in my life that now is being poured out in other things where things come to mind. And it's not something that I read that morning. It's that it's a whole 10 years now of studying the Bible. And again, depending on what situation you are in life, you might be at the very first of this kind of devotional practice, those first few years, or you maybe have been studying the Bible for 20 or 30 years, and you can recognize the storehouse that you have inside of you from those consistent daily practices. And what used to be difficult in the beginning, whether that's laundry or meal planning or your Bible study, what used to be difficult in the beginning has now become easy. It's become second nature. And I think this is the reason What I'm talking about right now is the reason why you can't just wing it with your rule of life because there's things that you want to work on and solidify. But if you never make a plan, it will never happen and you'll never be able to look back at your life and say, I did this thing and it was so good and so life-giving. And yes, it was difficult in the beginning to create this habit, but whenever I look back on it, it has been such a fruitful, good thing. If we approached any type of care of our homes like I just said, where it's like, ah, well, it's too difficult, so we're not going to do that. It's too difficult, so we're never going to make a meal at home. Or it's too difficult, so we're never going to do laundry. Like, I guess you could live that way, but that would be really chaotic. But you say, no, I'm just going to work on it a little bit at a time. And as I work on it and as I grow, it gets easier and easier to where at some point you look at it and meal planning is a breeze. You don't even really think about it. It's just what you do. 
laundry is just what you do. Taking care of your home is just what you do. And it's not as difficult. You want these spiritual practices to go through that same kind of growth where, yeah, in the beginning, it was difficult to make sure that you had time to read your Bible and do these devotional practices. In the beginning, it was difficult to do family devotions every night to make sure that you're uh, discipling your kids. In the beginning, it was difficult to uh, get to church, you know, Sundays and Wednesdays to have that discipleship time with uh, other believers. It was difficult, but you did it. And as you did it, you start to see this growth over time. And then it becomes second nature because it's a habit and that's what you want. But if you never plan for those habits, the habit will never just magically happen. You have to put a plan in place. We want to live these purposeful, intentional lives. And if anything that I could talk about on the podcast, that is the thing that I want us to know. We want to live purposeful, intentional lives. You are in charge of your life. You're not in control of everything that happens. God is. But you're in charge of a lot more than I think people like to talk about. I think they like to say that life is just happening at them. So there's no way that they could get up in the morning because life is just too busy. It's like, well, no, like you are establishing your boundaries based on your beliefs because you want to steward your time well so that you're glorifying God. And you, you have to say, I'm going to set these boundaries to do what I know is right. And that's up to you. That's, that's your choice of what you are choosing to prioritize in your life. We want to have this foundation of our lives so that we can implement them and have these habits that really glorify God. So now that we've talked about all this, how do you actually do it? How do you create these habits, these rhythms to create a life that really glorifies God, a life that you uh, feel like fills you up, allows you to live for him and helps you to pour into other people and serve other people, to show love to other people. Well, I think there's four steps that you need to follow to brainstorm your rule of life. So again, a rule of life is a system of habits. So some of these steps are going to mimic some of our steps that we've talked about, about creating habits that uh, stick, habits that help you reach your goals. Um, and so you're going to see that in just a minute. If you listen to any of my things that I've done on habits, you're going to see similar steps with that. A rule of life though, it differs from a planning system because again, it's not necessarily that we're trying to do goals. It's not where we're trying to get more done. I'm not making a rule of life so I can run a 5k. I'm making a rule of life so that I have these systems of of habits in place that help me live out my principles. And so that is where it really differs from some of the stuff that we've talked about before. So our four, uh, steps are, You need to begin with a strong foundation. You need to set your goals. You need to brainstorm your habits. Then you need to map out daily, weekly, and yearly rhythms. So let's start first off with your strong foundation. Your strong foundation is all the stuff we've talked about before in the previous episodes. You shouldn't start with your rule of life. So if you're like, eh, I don't really care about any of these other things, doctrine, who likes that stuff? And you just jump to your rule of life. Basically what you're doing is you're establishing habits just kind of based on whatever you feel like. And again, our feelings shouldn't be our guide. So really what you need to do is you need to start with developing your doctrines, your virtues, your principles. And then what you do is you use those principles as you're the jumping off point. So you're not making a rule of life just based on your doctrines. You've made principles based on your doctrines and your virtues. And then those principles are the things that you can look at for creating your rule of life. So you can check the previous episodes uh, to figure out how to create that foundation or look at some of my workbooks on the shop. But then let's go to our second step. So our second step is you need to set your goals. And what I mean by that, again, it's not like a goal like, I want to run a 5k or I want to read 52 books this year. It's not a resolution. A rule of life, basically, again, it's just that system of habits. And so we want to have that strong biblical foundation. What we want to figure out is what spiritual, vocational, and uh, relational rhythms or habits we want to have in our lives. And so we need to start off not with brainstorming a list, We need to start off by figuring out our aspirations for each of those areas. So again, those areas are our spiritual, vocational, and relational areas of our lives. And importantly, I think what we really need to ask ourselves is this question. And really, I think 
these are the, this is something that for me is key questions that I try to think about all the time. And I don't know if it's just because of my uh, background because of the, and that's why I think about this. I don't know if everybody kind of thinks about this or maybe it's just as you get older, you think about this. But really, I just think you need to be asking yourself, you know, as I look back on my life when you're dead and gone <laughs> um, and you are older or, you know, if you, at your funeral, what are people going to say about you? How are people going to say where they look at you and they say, oh, I know that she was about this thing. And, you know, if you, if people look at you and they say, oh, I know you were about, I don't know, pickleball. <laughs> that was popular for like a hot minute. I don't know if it's as popular as it was uh, a couple of months ago. But if people look at you and they're like, oh, they were about this, about exercising or about, um, I don't know, reading books. I read a lot of books. If that's the only thing that people know about me, that I like to read books, what good is that? Like to me, it's like, that's not something that I want to be the defining thing in my life. Uh, I've heard this question where they talk about your kids. It's like, if ki- your kids described your home, you know, they've grown up, moved off, gone to college, or maybe they have their own family with their own kids. And they say, Hey, like, what would be one word that your parents would use to describe your home or your homeschool if you're, no, if you're a homeschooling family? And as you think about that question, what would you want it to be? Would you want it to be calm, comforting, encouraging? Is that how they would describe it now? Is it hectic? Is it chaotic? How would you want them to describe you? Are you nice, loving, gracious? Are you angry, stressed? Uh, I I think this is a key question for our lives. And I think that's part of what wisdom is, is that you look at life with eternity in mind. And so that helps you to understand kind of where you're at and what you're doing in your goals. So I think we consider our aspirations, not by, oh, I've always wanted to do this, this thing, not like a bucket list. You consider your aspirations whenever you're creating a rule of life in terms of your legacy. So as you think about what you want to be known for in light of eternity, what, what kind of goals, what kind of, uh, what do you aspire to be? And so I would ask yourself that question. When you consider your legacy, what do you want your spiritual life to look like? What do you want your vocational life to look like? And what do you want your relational life to look like? And asking yourself those three questions, you'll get a picture of the type of life that you want and the type of impact that you want to have. And then that will help you to create your habits. I, I think Sally Clarkson is a great example. I've mentioned her quite a bit. Um, but, you know, she had certain things, certain ideals for her home, for her life. And that has colored basically everything that she's done. She wanted her home to be loving and gracious for her kids to work for the kingdom, for her home to be like a, a, a little mini kingdom that creates these workers, these disciples that go out and spread the message for God. And so that has basically, that changed her whole way of approaching home and it has affected everything that she's done. And so because of that, she had that aspiration and all the habits that she created, which she wrote a whole book about, helped her to reach that aspiration that she had. So what are your aspirations? That's the first thing you have to ask yourself. Then next things, this is step three, is then you need to brainstorm your habits. So just like we do whenever we have goals that we want to reach, whenever you have these aspirations that you want to reach, you need to brainstorm habits that will help you to get there. So these are things that you can use your principles. Uh, So what you would do is you would write down your aspirations and then you would look back at your principles. I've mentioned the stewardship one. So if you say, okay, I want people, I want to make a big impact. So whether that's vocationally, or uh, I guess you could say that's be could be spiritually as well. But let's say you want to make a big impact for the message of the kingdom of God. And then I see one of my principles is, well, I need to steward my things by giving my first fruits back to God. So then that kind of goes into this idea of tithing. So then I could look at a a daily or weekly rhythm. And maybe daily, I try to apply this by setting off some time to work in a ministry. Or maybe weekly, it's that I give uh, money to your local church or a missions uh, organization. And so that is a way where you have walked through the steps of, you know, basically you have these big ideas and you have your principles, which are kind of your ideals, and then you apply those. And so you apply those very specifically to your circumstances. Um, So for me, you know, this is where it has to get really specific to you. 
Whereas I could say like, you know, that we tithe. Well, that's great. But you need to figure out like an actual number. Like I'm going to give this much and I'm going to give it in the, you know, the church's offering plate, or I'm going to give this much and I am going to write a check once a month to, you know, the youth group. Um, one thing that we do uh, is we do meals at the church. And so one of the things that I have kind of made it my thing to do is I try to take at least one week of the meal. And so for a, a meal for, you know, 50, 60 people that can get a little bit pricey, but I put that in with like my tithe. Like that is a way that I serve my community. We also have a compassion child. And so I, uh, that is another way that you're serving. So what I am doing is different than what other people would do, but you have to pick out how you're going to actually live out this principle. And I don't know everybody's situation, so I can't say this is exactly how this works. So this is where it really comes based on what you think about your specific situation. How could you apply those principles that you have? Then the last step I would recommend, so this would be step number four, is basically you need to organize all of the different habits that you have. Uh, You know, one of the things that we have talked about is like, Every single one of these uh, foundations that I've mentioned, I've always recommended narrowing it down. So only choosing 10 doctrines to focus on, only creating 15 core virtues, uh, trying to limit yourself to 20 principles. Um, And part of that is just because if you get too many, it gets so unwieldy that you never remember it and it's too much work and then you'll just forget all about it. With your habits, you know, I wouldn't say like you have to limit it to a certain number, like 20 or 30. I would say like 50 habits, like that's, it's a little bit much, but you do need to organize it. So you might feel like, oh, I'm, I'm going to create so many habits that it would get really difficult to kind of go through this list based on principles. So instead what you should do is you should map out your habits, uh, and map them out based on, you know, daily, weekly, uh, maybe yearly rhythms. So you could look, we have a workbook on creating your ideal schedule. So you could put some of these habits on your ideal schedule. And uh, you could use that kind of cyclical schedule to make sure that you are following this rule of life. Uh, You could also uh, just match map them out in quadrants. So based on certain areas of life. Um, One of the ways that I have mapped this out is looking at habits that pertain to devotion and worship is one section. Section two is family and home. Section three is work and ministry. And section four is play and rest. I think if you look at that, that kind of four quadrant, um, it it helps you keep it balanced. And it also makes sure that you're thinking about all of these different areas. I think a lot of times if I told you, here's some spiritual disciplines, like what do you think that you should do in your life? You might automatically say, oh, I need to read my Bible and I need to pray. Well, that's great. And yes, you do. Uh, That's foundational. But what are some other things that you need to do? And it could be things that you don't even think about. So family and home, it may not be on your radar that you could do family worship time with your family, especially if you're not in the homeschool world. A lot of people do kind of that is a little bit more popular where they do family devotions. But even if your kids are in public school, you can still do family worship. You people, they even have their own, like they put on a worship song, everybody sings, and it might be a little bit awkward if your kids are in middle school and you've never done it before, but you can still uh, start a habit now and that will create certain feelings in your kids about how to approach devotion time and talking about God in a place that's not church. And it will just, it, it will be good for your kids. And so I think that these are things that if you want it to be balanced, you need to look at all of these different areas. So yes, devotion and worship is important, but also look at how you can um, have habits that affect your family, your home, your work, ministry, play, and rest. So here would be an example that I have from my own rule of life. So I mentioned, and so this goes through the steps. So I'm going to start with our doctrines, and then I'm going to move through every single step so that you could see an example of how this would look. But again, it requires a lot of work and a lot of thought from you to do this completely, the whole method. So this would be something that you can't just figure out in an hour. It it would be something that it would be a process that you would have to think on, mull over, because it requires you to think about lots of different areas of your Christian life. So the first thing that you need to do with your method of Christian living is you have to figure out your doctrines. I mentioned that before. So One of the doctrines that I mentioned is that every good thing is come from God. So we're only stewards of good things. So then the Christian virtue would be stewardship. So one of my principles is I steward my time, people, possessions, and talents well to glorify God and maximize my impact on the kingdom. 
And so my aspiration is I want to look back on my life and feel like I've lived it well, serving others and glorifying God. I want others to look at my life and say that it was fruitful, that I've done something well and good and made uh, disciples, bared fruit. I want God to look at my life and say, well done, good and faithful servant. So all the things I've listed so far are foundational beliefs. And so I'd imagine and I would hope that other people, this is not unique to me. Uh, This is something I would hope that a lot of people would want God to look at them and say, yes, well done, good and faithful servant. I hope every Christian wants that. And so the thing that would be specific to me is how this would impact my rule of life. And so the first thing that I say for my rule of life is I prioritize uh, ministry over mindless pursuits like social media and entertainment by devoting my nap time to work time. So normally on my podcast uh, right now, it's nap time. And so this is when I'm recording this podcast. This is when I work on the blog posts and things like that. So instead of just like watching a show or reading a book, I work on this kind of stuff during nap time. And it just helps me to focus on doing something that I feel is fruitful. Um, second, I give of my time and resources when I can, giving my first fruits. So we've talked about this one. So my first moments of the day is devoted to devotions. And my first priority in the week is devoted to church and ministry. So whenever I do my weekly review, uh, whenever I'm planning out my week, I always put the time for church. And church is just it's just a non-negotiable because I have prioritized that. And lastly, I spend time honing my talents each week. So when I'm asked to use them in the service of ministry, I say yes if I'm able. So if that's teaching, if that's uh, uh, helping out with the worship team, if that's uh, doing something else, something organizing something. I try to say yes and prioritize that thing if somebody has asked me about it. So I could probably go on, but um, you could see how with each of these things, this one principle of this idea of stewardship really has created, I mean, that's three or more habits. And you could see how uh, that could kind of grow into a list of uh, longer habits. So part of what you want to do whenever you're creating a rule of life is just to try to go through each principle. But again, after you organize that, you might see that you might have a little bit more, um, you know, 30 or more habits that you might come up with that you want to work on. Now, if you have 30 to 50 habits and you've said, this would be good. I should do this. Oh, I should do that too. And you have this list and you maybe you've seen something on Instagram that somebody's been doing Bible journaling. You want to do that too. You see somebody else is doing nature walks and they talk about God there. You want to do that too. So you start to see all these different habits that you think are really cool and you want to add to your life. Well, how do you make sure that you actually follow through? This would be the last thing. Like, how do you, how do you make sure that after you've done all this work, from start to finish, you've looked at your doctrines, you've looked at your virtues, you've looked at your principles, and then you've created your rule of life, which is just another step. How do you make sure that every day, whenever you wake up, if one of your habits is to read your Bible, that you actually read your Bible? Like, how do you actually do that? I think, you know, with any exercise regime, diet, New Year's resolution, uh, it can, a rule of life could be the same, where it's just this easily forgotten thing. You think it's great. You wish you could do it, but you're like, mm, I tried that not going very well. Well, how do you, how do you make sure that it doesn't just kind of get stuck in the recesses of your mind and instead you actually follow through with that? You need to think about this phrase. Whenever we say a rule of life, we don't say you do a rule of life. We say we, you keep a rule of life. And I love that kind of picture. Cause in my mind, if I say, you know, you're keeping it, I imagine you like holding it close. Like, you know, I have uh, two young kids. And so right now they're really getting at that age. My daughter is just starting to walk and now she's just starting to say like, no mine. And she's like holding it. So if she's playing like keep away or something like that, and she's trying to run away from her brother, She's holding it close. She's treasuring it. I think with a rule of life, you kind of have to cling to it. You have to hold it close. And you have to choose to keep that thing, that you have to stand your ground, your stakes in the ground. You're saying, I'm not moving. This is something that I have decided that I am going to do. And so I think to do that, there are some practices that you can follow that will make it easier for you to keep this rule. But again, you have to just think of it as it's an everyday choice that you are making, that you're like, no, this is important to me. I have said it's important to me and I'm going to act like it's important to me. Um, But some ways that you can do that every day is you can first 
create a document. So even if you don't use my word book, uh, workbook, you could still create some kind of official thing. I would recommend typing it so you can print it off multiple times. You could also just write it in a journal and rip it out and just kind of stick it up someplace, but stick it up in like the common areas of your house. So don't like squirrel it away, uh, you know, with your devotional stuff where it like sits in your closet, like stick it up in your kitchen or something like that. And that way, every day that you walk by it, you'll be able to look at it and read through those. Then the other thing is I would maybe post it in a couple different places. So you could keep it in your Bible, keep it on your fridge, keep it by your desk. I would also try to memorize it. So keeping it in multiple places will help you with this. But try to memorize it because it will help you to uh, kind of keep these things in your mind and keep yourself focused on it. Um, again, memorization is very good for making sure something is practical. And you can think about it throughout the day about how you're going to implement some certain things. I would memorize basically everything that we've talked about with your method um, so far. Then the next thing is I would focus on just one habit at a time. Remember, your rule is not a fad diet. It's not like this crash thing that you're going to do and then you're going to like, eh, no, I'm giving up on that thing. You don't want your rule of life to be like that. Instead, you want to make sure that you master one habit at a time and then move on. I uh, have been getting into some ideas from classical education. And one of the things that they talk about is this idea of festina lente, which is this idea of just make haste slowly. And so basically they talk about it with education that you want to cover one thing and do it really well and understand it. Uh, they call it, you know, you don't want to cover the material. You want to uncover the riches of the material. I thought that was really good. But it's the same thing with this. You don't want to just cover your habits and try to do all 50 habits that you've thought are really great and cool in one week and then you never do a single one again. Instead, you want to do one at a time. And if it takes two years to implement all these habits, who cares? Because if your life, think about it in the end game. If your life lasts 80 years and so you have all this time that you could do, do one at a time and do it well Make sure it sticks before you move on to the next thing. And then you might find, again, just like we talked about with your habits in your house, that it'll get easier and easier and easier over time. And then you can add other things in and you'll be more likely to stick to those habits. You can keep a habit tracker. Um, this is a great way of, you know, as you focus on each habit, print off a habit tracker for just that habit. Certain habits will be a lot easier to keep than others. Um, again, depending on, you know, if you've been reading your Bible every morning for three or four years, you it probably won't be that difficult to say, okay, you keep reading your Bible. So you might not need to even do a habit tracker for that. Or if church is just kind of something that you always do, again, you probably don't need to work on that habit. But if maybe one thing that you want to do is do fasting once a week from something, then that might be something you have to keep a habit tracker. So you track when you do that fast. Also include your family and friends. I think it's really important, um, to one, teach your kids. So, you know, everything that we talked about with this could be used as a teaching tool for your kids. Your kids should know doctrine too. They should know about these virtues. They should know about different principles for life. So by teaching them these things, you're equipping them to make sure that they understand some of the things that you've talked about and that that will become their foundation. So if somebody asks them later on, hey, what do you believe? They have an answer for that. If they say, okay, well, how does this affect your everyday life? They have an answer for that too, because you've taught them those things. Yes, your rule may be different. You know, your rule, my rule is different than my husband's because he works outside of the home. I don't. And so we just have a different kind of uh, rhythm to the day. But even though that's the case, you can still encourage one another. So even if your rule is different, you can encourage one another. And for your kids, you're teaching them what a Christian life looks like. Also, teach somebody about it. So even if it's not your kids, if you don't have kids, getting together a small group, um, maybe posting about it on social media, writing about it, uh, all of those things can help as far as learning it. Acting like, Whenever you teach somebody, even if you're acting like you're teaching, I don't know, your dog or something like that, you will learn it better than if you were just kind of doing a devotional or something about it because you just have to flesh out what you believe. I, I learned so much from doing posts and things like this um, and probably a lot more than you guys learned because I'm diving in deep and picking out what is good, what is not good and trying to uh, create a, a series, a, a thought. And so that's important for you too, where you could step in and 
and teach somebody about it. And hey, churches always need uh, people to do devotions for, especially with like the youth and uh, Bible studies and things. So I'm sure if you wanted to teach somebody, you could, you could start with this and you could teach uh, a class at church. Um, so here's some quick benefits um, of a rule of life. So James Clear, he was the guy who post, uh, published Atomic Habits, and that book has swept the world by storm. So if you, um, you know, if you go and you Google anything online about habits, there is tons of stuff. I don't know. I think there's like 75,000 queries about habits like a month on Google. And that's just the word habits, not even everything else that goes into that. So there is a ton about habits that you, uh, could find online and people are just interested in this. People want to create good habits. They want to be consistent. At the same time, habits are tricky to do. They're difficult to start and often we just don't feel like doing those habits. So when we create a rule of life, we're choosing to be intentional about our habits and we're choosing to create habits that aren't just good because, you know, we'll get slim and trim or uh, maybe we're doing something that we've always wanted to do, learn a language or something like that. And so we're doing these habits because we are choosing to create a godly way of life. We know that if we create these, these habits are biblical and they're biblical because we have created this method that bases all of these habits on good, solid biblical principles. When we create our rule of life, we're choosing how we spend our time. And when something comes up, this rule is the thing that helps us to understand our boundaries that no, every day we eat at the dinner table because this is part of our rule of life. And we recognize the importance of this. There's a reason why we made this habit and we are sticking to it. Uh, there's a reason why, uh, we have said we're going to go to church on Sunday. So on Sunday mornings, we don't press news. We get up, get ready and go because it's important. It's a priority in our life. If somebody asks for you to lead a Bible study or a ministry and you recognize that service is important, you say yes, because again, it's in your rule. You've established that method of Christian living. Your rule of life becomes that backbone, that trellis, that your life can grow up as it grows up into this godly, uh, that this godly vine that bears fruit. And again, it bears fruit because it's connected to Jesus and a rule of life is the best way to cultivate that connection and to be obedient. So again, if you would like to walk through this process, you can find those workbooks. I have the bundle that goes into all of the things that we've talked about. Um, so if you're interested in, to, in working through all of these things, you can get those. You could even grab it and uh, go through all of this with somebody that you know. Um, and I just hope that this has been beneficial for you. Um, if you would, please leave a one to two sentence rating and review wherever you listen to podcasts. This just helps others find the show. I hope that you have a great week. And until then, keep creating a life you love and cultivating your heart for God. Bye. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of a more beautiful life collective podcast. If you haven't yet, please leave a rating and review wherever you listen to podcasts to help others find the show. While you're there, you can like and subscribe so that you never miss an episode. Don't forget to check out the blog in our store for more encouragement and resources on how to create a life you love and cultivate your heart for God. I'm Casey Fletcher, and I'll see you next week. Thank you.